Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, and um, can I pay a special mention to Christine Christian, who's the Deputy Chair of the Library, and also to Maxine McHugh, who is a board member of the Library. And I would also like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Now, as Kate said, this lecture is to honour Sir Edmund Barry, the founder of the library, this amazing library. And I, and probably many others, remember him or know him as the judge who sentenced Ned Kelly to death. So in preparing this lecture, I read about other aspects of his life, and particularly his interests in science and education. Now, I'm not a historian, but as I read, I found a marvellous story of a man who had a key role in laying the foundations in Melbourne, which has given us a platform to be one of the great knowledge cities of the world. So, he was born uh, on this day, uh, as Kate mentioned, in 1813 in County Cork, Ireland. He was the third son of a, of a military gentleman, Major General Henry Greenberry, and he, as the son, was also destined for the army. But there was no commission available for him, and I haven't discovered why there was no commission. There seemed to be plenty of wars going on, uh, but for some reason there was no commission, so he studied uh, law at Trinity College in Dublin. And when his father died, he had no income and no job, so what to do? Well, his situation was described in the obituary, which was published in the newspaper of the time, the Argus. And when I was a girl, the Argus was still in print. Anyway, the Argus described his situation in his obituary, as I said, as such. Um, the Australian colonies were beginning to be spoken of in the mother country as a land of promise to the uneasy classes. And equipped with good health and excellent education, adventurous spirit and a buoyant disposition, he emigrated out of necessity in 1839 to seek his fortune. I rather like the idea, the description of the uneasy classes. Anyway, he sailed to Australia in the Calcutta. And he was said to be a very engaging, charming and polite companion. So much so that it seems on the voyage to Australia, he conducted an unconcealed love affair with a married woman passenger. And as a consequence of this scandalous behavior, he was confined to his cabin by the captain for part of, for part of the voyage. So this event became known to Bishop Broughton in Sydney and probably doomed his prospects of a job there. So what to do? He had to look elsewhere. So he went south to the colony of uh, Port Phillip, which then went by the name of Bear Brass. And it was described as a small, shabby, struggling township, a mere clearing in the bush. Must have been a terrible shock. He'd come from Dublin, uh, which was a, a sophisticated city of about a quarter of a million people, down to this shabby little settlement of just a few thousand people. But there was no turning back, so he set up a law practice. And he built his practice and eventually became the first Solicitor General for Victoria when it separated from New South Wales, and then a judge of the Supreme Court, a position that he held for the rest of his life. But he must have been terribly busy because his fingerprints are over almost every cultural organisation of the time. His obituary describes the contribution. He said, during the gold rush years, the thirst for wealth was universal. And at a time when men's, most men's thoughts were absorbed by their own selfish schemes, Mr. Justice Barry devoted his attention to the practical execution of carefully considered schemes for the benefit of his own and future generations. So, he was the founder of the Melbourne Mechanics Institute, a member of the separation movement, president of the Melbourne Club, and he was active with others, notably Lieutenant uh, Governor Charles Joseph Latrobe, in establishing the Melbourne Hospital, the Philharmonic Society, importantly the Royal Society of Victoria, the Botanic Gardens, and even the Polo Club. 
and two of his most enduring achievements were the establishment of this library and the University of Melbourne. And in fact, he laid the uh, foundation stones for both the library and the university on the same day. So he was very busy. Now, the first public library was in his cottage on the western hill off Great Burke Street. And people would come to his home in the evenings to read his books and journals. And so the next step was to get a site for a proper library. And his friend, Lieutenant Governor Charles Joseph Latrobe, was consulted. And because he had the power to grant land, he granted this wonderful site to house not only the library, but also it was to house a gallery and a museum. And as Kate mentioned in her introduction, he had a passion for learning and a passion for the principle that knowledge and learning should be freely available to all. And I read one of his speeches, uh, the speech that he made on the opening of the free public library at Ballarat. It was very, very long, pages and pages, and it was very flowery. But he said, uh, that the aims of the library were for something higher than the mere accumulation of the yellow glittering precious gold. He had to argue against his colleagues for free admission uh, because many said that the masses didn't need education. So he spoke passionately and at the length in this speech and I think he was really saying, look, Jack's as good as his master and give him a chance and he'll do great things. But he also seemed to be a little bit vain. Um, there's a story in the, uh, the book by Alan Gross on La Trobe that he, that he said that as the library expanded, largely through Barry's own efforts, the Great Hall was built in his name. And when it was finished, he gathered all the workmen, the stonemasons and the carpenters, got them all together, and he gave them a marvellous speech, which must have been hours long, judging by the pamphlet that he wrote, if he read it all. And he compared the dimensions of his hall, the Barry Hall, with the dimensions of some of the great halls of the world. For example, the great temple at Karnak, at Luxor, the Parthenon, <laughs> and so maybe there was a touch of vanity. But both he and uh, Charles Latrobe were great supporters of science. And they both studied the natural sciences, as indeed had most educated men of the time, and presumably the women of the time, if they'd had a chance. They understood the power and the promise of science. The Royal Society of Victoria, the oldest learned society in Victoria, was established with their help in 1854. And it still uh, functions as a wonderful venue for science for the people today. And it, was the, it is the oldest learned society in Victoria. The first president was uh, Baron Frederick Monmuller, and he was also the government botanist. The government also appointed a government geologist. I was amazed. This little town appointed two government scientists, the government botanist, the government geologist. And when I looked at the catalogue of books of the first shipment of books for this library from Britain, and this was given to me by a member of Kate's team, Tim Hogan, and I looked at the authorship and I was amazed. At least half of all the authors of the books they ordered uh, were scientific works. They came, they went right from the classics to the ancient Greek, to Euclid. They went through the 16th century, Galileo, Copernicus, 17th century, Newton, 18th century, Bernoulli, and for them, contemporary scientists such as Faraday, Darwin, and his very best friend, Joseph Hooker, and many others. Science was uppermost in their minds, and uppermost in Barry's mind as he ordered the books. Now, all this was happening against a backdrop of incredibly difficult and uncertain living conditions. Life was short and very uncertain. Life expectancy for men was 43 years, for women, 47. Disease was rife. Typhoid, smallpox, tuberculosis, diphtheria, measles, influenza, and so on. And more disease came with the ships. 
and there was no real understanding of how these diseases were transmitted and certainly no treatments that worked. It was the days of bloodletting, leeches and, and even worse. The prevailing belief was that miasmas or bad smells, bad odours somehow transmitted the disease. But science was coming and started to trump beliefs. Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch found the uh, microorganisms uh, under the microscope and associated them irrevocably with the causation of disease. Then came Lord Lister and others. And it became very clear then when microorganisms or germs were the cause of disease and you could see that some of them were transmitted by water, that the actions that they had at the time of using the Yarra River, both for pumping out drinking water and for pouring in the sewage and all the other rubbish, was not really a good idea. So it took a while, but Governor Latrobe determined to separate the sewage discharge from the drinking water. And he proposed that a sewage treatment farm be established at Werribee, and that a large tract of forest land be set aside to harvest clean drinking water. Amazing, and we've inherited that infrastructure. That was just amazing foresight. Now that, that time, that's the second part of the 19th century, as we mentioned, it was a time of great discovery and it was incredibly exciting for people. As I mentioned, once they could see germs under the microscope, the medical discoveries came in thick and fast. So hot on the heels of the discovery that microorganisms actually cause certain diseases came vaccination, then anaesthesia, and a rule of cleanliness in the operating rooms and the delivery rooms. Life became easier. And there were also amazing discoveries in all the sciences, astronomy, chemistry, physics, maths, and so on. And there were very many prosaic, very ordinary, everyday discoveries that made life easier safety match, the telephone, the electric light bulb. Science was making life easier and actually making it more fun too. So one fun thing I noticed in the patent literature was a patent for an egg beater with moving parts. So the first egg beater patent was granted in the US in 1856. And then there was a patent for blue denim jeans with copper rivets was granted to Levi Strauss in 1874. So people and the poets were very, very excited by science. And a poet, Edward Fitzgerald, uh, best known for his translation of the Ribai of, of, of Omar Khayyam, wrote at the time that science unrolls a greater epic than the Iliad. The present day teems with new discoveries. So the leaders of the time dealt with the uncertainties of everyday life by implementing policies based on sound science. And since those days, scientists, technologists, engineers have all built on the discoveries of those times to give us the, day, to give us the life we have today. We've now not only controlled the killer diseases of Barry's day, but amazingly, we've eliminated smallpox from the face of the earth and we've almost eliminated poliomyelitis. Apparently only five cases have been reported this year. That is an amazing achievement. But we take our modern living day to day, safe food, safe water, good medical treatment, rapid transport, communications and so on for granted. But these parts of our life were unknown and probably unknowable in Barry's time. They certainly couldn't foresee what the next 50 years, let alone the next 150 years, would bring. And in turn, we can't see what the next 50 or the next 150 years will bring. But we do have a few glimpses of what might happen, what is possible in maybe 10, 20, 30 years. Well, in a, I'd say interplanetary travel probably looks set to happen with the efforts of the space barons, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos at SpaceX and Blue Origin. They're aiming to establish colonies on Mars. And maybe in the future, Earth will be uh, 
residential and light industrial, and Mars will be heavy industrial. Well, that's what Bezos suggests. Maybe it'll happen. Certainly, we are faced with the dilemma of how to grow our civilization on planet Earth without irreversibly damaging it. And all our environmental pressures are due to the pressures of people. And as there seems little appetite to curb population growth, maybe interplanetary colonization will be the answer. Who knows? Uh, we also have artificial intelligence, and that's going to change uh, society in ways we can't entirely predict. But I think it's unlikely to be like a Terminator scenario. Uh, it's essentially, artificial intelligence is, is essentially machine learning via pattern recognition, uh, especially patterns that don't vary with time. It's not really intelligence in that there is no capability of human thought. Um, and this and big data is having sort of really profound effects and quite intrusive effects on our lives. Uh, robotics is replacing repetitive work and enhancing human capability. And almost certainly we'll have new diseases. And at the same time, our longevity is increasing and many are striving for immortality. So we can get little glimpses of the immediate future, but beyond a decade or so, we can't imagine. So I, I think back to the time when I was a young student uh, and our professor of biochemistry came into our lecture ho hall holding a paper. And he said, this paper is the most important paper of your lifetime. We said, wow, uh, really? And this was the Watson and Crick paper which defined the structure of DNA. And we said, why? Why was it being so profound? And he said, well, look, it's such a fundamental discovery that it'll change the world in ways we can't conceive. So this was back when I was a student in the late 1950s. And it's true. We couldn't imagine then its impact on diagnostics, forensic science, uh, reproductive biology, crop production, medicine and so on. All those applications were years in the making. So the scientists, the entrepreneurs, the engineers, the financiers, the regulators, all had to work to make those new applications and to create whole new industries based on that initial discovery of the structure of DNA. An amazing story in one lifetime. Um, so I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes expanding on the process by which this knowledge is accumulated. It starts with an ability to say we don't know something. That is to admit ignorance. It's a, it's a freedom to doubt existing wisdom. Now that sounds pretty simple and maybe quite obvious. But in the history of science, there have been very hard-fought battles against religious beliefs and against prevailing wisdom, going all the way back to Galileo. Scientists are comfortable with ignorance. It's not an admission of inadequacy or failing or an assault on our egos. It's the starting point for establishing new knowledge. So you start with a question, with an unknown, with an uncertainty. And you try and address the question by gathering data, doing experiments, till eventually you can propose a hypothesis which accounts for all the known data. You can't be selective, you can't discard data that doesn't fit. If some observations don't fit the hypothesis, you have to go back to the drawing board or back to the, back to the bench or back to wherever you can make the observations and revise the hypothesis till ultimately You've got a piece of new knowledge that's got a degree of certainty. It's a process of going from relative uncertainty to relative certainty. So new knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty. Some are quite unsure, some are pretty sure, but none are absolutely certain in all respects. So these are two hallmarks of science. One is comfort with ignorance, and the second is a pro it's a process of moving from relative uncertainty to relative certainty. So decades of building knowledge piece by piece, more or less by that process, more or less, 
has brought us from Redmond Barry's day to our time. He couldn't have imagined the world we live in. And I couldn't even imagine the world we live in today when I was a student. So how do we best prepare for the future, an uncertain future? I think the best advice goes back to the approach of Sir Edmund Barry and Charles Latrobe. Educate the citizens, build up our institutions and our capability in science and technology. I mean, obviously not to the exclusion of the humanities, but we need, we are being driven by technology. We need that capability. We need a science literate population. I mean, for, for a number of reasons. Not only do we want to attract more students to tackle the hard sciences, become the scientists of the future, but we have to have voters of the future able to contribute to debates on policies relevant to the new sciences and technologies. I think our aim should be for our children to learn about the scientific way of thinking, to be sceptical and to be able to interrogate data, to challenge assumptions and assertions. I think a really good mantra is, OK, show me the data. They need to be able to distinguish between misinformation and verifiable facts. They'll need this capacity to be involved in the decision making through our democratic processes in our world being shaped by science and technology. Our politicians also have to be on board. Scientists can't determine what to do with the discoveries. We need politicians who are familiar with the language and the process of establishing new technologies and familiar with the careful, considered process of decision making. I must say I was quite alarmed to read recently that one of our politicians is reported to have said that investment in science was an act of intellectual snobbery. Uh, that's not a really good start. Um, but we also need skilled people within the government to manage the regulation of the new technologies. So it's true that all the technology can be used for good or not so good purposes. And regulations are required to protect society from the misuse of new technologies. So again, I go back to my own personal history in the, uh, at the time when the first genes were transferred from one bacterium to another, uh, everyone said, oops, what is this? And the scientists themselves decided to place a moratorium on new experiments until safety guidelines could be established. And that was a global moratorium and the safety, safety guidelines were established by the scientists but the government regulations came in much later. Uh, in Australia, uh, they were led by a wonderful Melbourne scientist, uh, Professor Nancy Millis, and sadly she's not with us anymore, but I'd like to pay tribute because she was a wonderful leader in this, in this area. She oversaw a regulatory framework for gene technologies that not only is used in Australia, but is used in many countries in our region. And it has ensured the very safe use of the technologies to the benefit of society. The same situation comes about with each new technology. The technology is always ahead of the regulatory framework. For example, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, those technologies can be used legitimately for preventing crime and protecting society, or they could become very effective tools of social control. So again, we need a regulatory framework, and indeed our Chief Scientist of Australia, Dr Alan Finkel, recently advocated that we need to start developing a framework for control of artificial intelligence. Now the scientists can usually see the next steps and the consequences of discoveries earlier and more clearly than the onlookers. Um, science is indeed the endless frontier. So in summary, I should say that uh, it's clear. Science and technology are driving rapid change. Secondly, we don't know with any confidence how this will affect our civilization and our way of life. 
And thirdly, we need to improve the science literacy of our population. In closing, I can only marvel at the courage and the dedication of Sir Edmund Barry and indeed others such as Charles Latrobe. They established the basis for Melbourne to grow from such very humble beginnings in the little clearing in the bush to become one of the, one of the great cities of the world, renowned for its excellence in the sciences and the arts. Sir Edmund Barry died uh, at the age of 67 from diabetes and a carbuncle in his neck. Both of these would now be treatable and he couldn't know that. But he lies just up the road in the cemetery, the Melbourne General Cemetery, and I think we owe him a, a debt of gratitude. Thank you very much. Thank you.